Well, welcome everybody. My name is Daniel Kostelski. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Chalkline Sports. Uh, probably um, not going to be able to uh, to come close to that opening act, but we're going to we're going to give it a bash. Um, we're going to be talking about early stage investments, and we've got a couple of different perspectives. Uh, we've got Kelly and Justin who are starting businesses and solving pain points inside of the gaming industry, and then we've got Scott and and Davis who are investors. So we're looking at the really the same issue. We're just looking at it from a couple of different perspectives. I'm going to hand it over to the the panel. Let them introduce themselves real quickly, and then we'll get into the discussion. Scott, you can go ahead. Sure. I'm, I'm, morning, everybody. I'm Scott Secord, um, partner with Cap Cardinal Sports Capital. Um, we are early stage. Um, uh, to to mid stage investors in, in sports gaming and technology space um, started to fund uh, about a year ago and we just recently made an announcement about an incremental growth in our fund um, in partnership with a, with an investment bank called Canaccord Genuity um, to invest in early stage and mid stage growth companies within the sports and gaming space. How much? Uh, up to $100 million. We deployed about $25 million to this point, um, and we will deploy probably another $75 million. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, so you can ask Scott for some cash here in just a little bit. <laughs> Kelly. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Kelly Brooks. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Quarter Four. Uh, we kicked off in 2019, uh, right before COVID, so that was fun. We have raised money um, during some of the most stressful times in the last few years, and have managed to do it uh, with some great partners. Disclosure, um, Cardinal has been a part of that journey for us. Uh, but we are a deep learning neural network, uh, very progressive tech company, and we generate about 3 million play-by-play -play, uh, predictions a day. Uh, so we are currently raising, and it's very timely with this panel, um, some of the interesting shifts we're seeing in the industry right now. Nice. Davis. Uh, Davis Catlin from Las Vegas Sands. I've uh, been an investor um, and consumer, broadly speaking, for about 15 years now. Joined Las Vegas Sands uh, last year. Uh, we like to joke that our mandate is to invest in $1 million to $1 billion uh, checks. Um, so, but I'd say our focus right now is primarily on um, kind of pure venture stage businesses and, and being very long term partners. Uh, my background was in a fund vehicle. And I think what's interesting is working inside of a corporation. Um, it's controlled we have a permanent capital view we don't have a time horizon we don't have lps it's all about building something really interesting and special by backing the right team and partners and so that's really our focus and um you know but las vegas sands i guess you'd say is a large casino operator for those of you who don't know nice justin yeah cool hey i'm justin i'm the founder and ceo of betty we are innovating in the online casino space for the regulated north american market we've we closed a about a $2 million pre-seed round, um, which I led personally, um, along with like a bunch of uh, venture funds. I, I previously started a company called the, the QO Gaming Group, which is a sports analytics company slash affiliate platform. And that business, uh, we started in 2015. So we started in like the daily fantasy space. And then, you know, April 2018, sports betting started. And then we kind of rode that one um, to an ultimate exit in, in November of 2020 to a, a publicly traded uh, media company here in the U.S. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. Uh, let, let's, let's start with the entrepreneurs. Just, can you just share a little bit, and we'll start with you, Kelly, just share a little bit about the pain points that, that your company is solving um, and how you, how you define success. Uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a startup, you know, we're looking for revenue and we're looking for possibly, um, you know, to be profitable, but there are other indicators mm -hmm. out there. I'm a, I'm a B2B SaaS. I was looking for 10 unaffiliated customers, you know, to, to, to find product market fit. How do you define the success for, for quarter four? And Justin, I'm coming, I'm coming to you around QL after this. Yeah, so um, our pain point is basically to reduce customer acquisition costs through progressive content, uh, building loyalty uh, amongst new and existing betting groups. Um, we have uh, very pieces of data, millions and millions of data points, a feature set uh, that can connect to any content system. And uh, you know, our goal is to help reduce that customer acquisition cost and to make retention uh, more of a reality for, for the players in this space. Uh, for us, success right now, the phase of our company, we are very revenue focused um, and we won't stop. We're building this to scale it. And you can't do that without revenue. Um, some people might disagree, but it's true, you can't. 
Uh, so right now we are onboarding as many contracts as possible to really determine the product market fit and where our sweet spot is and when we're going to be the most profitable. Uh, so success right now is continuously landing that, uh, hitting our revenue targets for the year, and um, also partnering with strategic groups that understand progressive technology and are willing to productize with us and take advantage of what we have. And Justin, your, was your business B2B or B2C? Yeah, so what I'm building now is, is a, B2C, a B2C product um, in the online casino space. Um, we're trying to keep it a little, you know, not open up the kimono too much, but we think that uh, women are actually pro probably the most important segment within the online casino space and, and also quite underserved. So um, we're, we're trying to fix a lot of problems. Yeah, there you go. Nice. And are there any uh, indicators? Maybe let's talk, let's talk about your previous business as well. What were some of the, the, the success factors there as well? Yeah, so previously we built this product called BetQL, which was like a Bloomberg for sports betting. And the insight we had in you know, 2018 was there's like this relationship between the customer and the operator. It's almost like it's, it's really a symbiotic one, right? Where it's the operator really wants a customer that will hang out and play for a long period of time. That's the only way this, this you know, really the ecosystem will scale. So we saw where there was like a knowledge gap where sports bettors need to get better educated so they can make better decisions. And we thought that data was the most elegant solution to actually get them up that learning curve. So that's what BetQL was. It was how do you help people figure out what to bet on and why so that either they are you know, making more money or losing less, but the KPI was like increasing the, you know, the entertainment value of every dollar spent ultimately. Nice. And so, Scott, when, when, when you were opening up this new fund, you know, what, what is it that you're, that you're looking at? What are, what are some of the pain points that maybe you see in the industry that you guys are, are willing to put money behind? I think for us, we look across, you know, a variety of different areas. It's not one part of the sports gaming or technology space that we look at. We look at all different types of companies. I think, for example, with Kelly in quarter four, uh, not the first thing you think about in sports betting is AI, but it's, it's certainly something that we found early on that made sense. A lot of sense. I think for us, it's um, it's outside. We like technology as part of the piece. I think from an investment standpoint, I get behind that. In my past life, technology is always the big part of our business. So we look at um, companies that I think, and I hate the word disruptive, but I think companies that um, cr have created a technology that can solve many of the problems within the space or provide value to existing, whether it's betting brands or other groups to help acquire um, what everybody's trying to do is the lower cost of acquisition. So we look at those types of, of companies that we think can help in that space. That's key to us, but we look at everything across the board. There's nothing, anything. Thank you. Davis. Yes. Any, anything in particular that you all are looking at other than $1 million to $1 billion? Yeah. Uh, sorry. I just wanted to, um, yeah, I would say that for us, it's a little bit different because we are obviously a, a large land-based operator. Um, so my role is you know, often entrepreneurs ask me, are you strategic or are you a financial investor? And, and I kind of say, yes, you know, it uh, depends on, on how you need me to act in this situation. I think that flexibility is really interesting. And so for me, there's kind of two things. One is, you know, deploying capital into innovative technologies, the companies that are at the choke points of these industries that we're all interested in. Um, and once you find those, you know, I think those will create both financial value and possibly strategic value over the very long term. Um, we've publicly said that we're, you know, interested in the B2B business. Um, so, you know, I do have a role where I'm also kind of evaluating operating companies. Um, and so really it's kind of a, we're, we're very secretive about the end goal, if you will. But I think yeah. if you look at the sorts of things that we're publicly disclosing, we're investing in, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the obscure, um, not B2C. They're not running um, ads across ESPN constantly. It's kind of the hidden players that are really important to the ecosystem. And I think right. that's really important for us. And, and maybe just, just to dive in the B2B versus the B2C uh, you know, side of things, you know, what is it that maybe isn't, isn't so sexy about, about those for you? Uh, I mean, losing money is a right. starting point. Um, you know, I think for us, uh, the thing that really, you know, I wasn't looking for a job when I found this. I knew the team. Um, and I think this kind of permanency of capital and building something really big and profitable and taking a very long-term view and, and 
thinking about returns and capital as long alongside splash value. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, it'd be great to run TV ads all the time and burn a billion dollars, but it's just not interesting as an investor. Sure. Um, so I think that's, I mean, it really does come down to that. If the B2C business was the most attractive from an economic standpoint, we You'd would be in. It. Yep. And so, yeah, just, 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 you know, looking at the past 12 months, there's certainly been some changes in the, in the gaming space. And I'm going to say the gaming space in general, um, you know, iGaming and, and, and online casino, as discussed previously, um, you know, doing quite well, sports betting uh, on its own, maybe not so well. Um, but then the land-based casinos, the American Gaming Association uh, just recently came out with a stat today that said that the quarter one 2022 was the best uh, that the commercial casinos had, had ever done. Um, so there's certainly some, some peaks and valleys in the, in the current makeup, but there's been a lot of changes over the past 12 months. You know, Justin, maybe, maybe just talk about your approach to, to being an entrepreneur in, in, in this new kind of phase that we are seeing. And Kelly, I'm going to come to you next. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, so what, what comes to mind was like in, we started our, our, you know, our business or my last business in 2015 when, when DFS was in its heyday and we had raised capital right before Schneiderman <clears throat> shut DFS down in New York. So that was one example of like kind of regulation touches the, in the entire surface area of the industry and just kind of connects things up, right, sometimes. And then you fast forward, you know, COVID happens and then sports shuts down and, and we ended up also raising around in that situation. We, you know, I actually bought like six or 7% of the company from people who had common stock. So I bought it all up because everyone's freaking out. And then I packaged it up with some new primary and then we got a round done like about a you know, million and a half. Like this was a month after the MBA was just shut down. It's creative. So I, I bring all that up because um, you just got to be more creative um and also realize that these you know everyone experiences it so it's almost like who deals with it better kind of gets out ahead yeah so, yeah i don't know if that answers the question but it, it does and scott and i were talking about it uh just now you know we, we were talking about the, the access to capital um you know what are your thoughts about entrepreneurs out there that are, have a great idea m might have started started that process w what do you think you know access to capital 12 months ago versus now yeah i think it's out there that capital is a lot tougher to get today than it was 12 months months ago um i think valuations certainly come back to hopefully to reality i think there's a lot of times where you look at companies where we have looked at lots of companies that we think have a great idea a great concept um management team all checks out but valuations are that's one of the biggest challenges now is coming back to earth with respect to what the valuation of the business is how are you pegging that valuation yes um there's still capital. There's lots of capital available. Certainly in the last month, we've seen the markets have uh, put people on the sidelines a little bit right now. And <laughs> I think that'll change, but um, a lot of red on your screen right now yeah. uh, when you're looking at it. So for us, um, I think the biggest thing where things be have become now versus where they were 12 months ago, um, valuation, I think, is the biggest thing. There's, there is capital out there, but I think you have to be realistic with respect to valuations. And, and Kelly, you're, you're out there raising money. Um, you know, how do... How does an entrepreneur approach valuation? I mean, I, I've always said it's art and science on, on my side. How, how, do you, how do you look at that? And, and what, are some, what are some ways to, to, to get as much value as a founder as you can and yet still be, you know, quote unquote, fair to the, to the investors? Yeah, so, I mean, we did our first raise right after COVID and it took us two months to raise $150,000 on the phone with four people five people, six people a day. So at that point, um, you know, valuation, uh, you know, it was low. We just needed the money to survive. Yes. Um, and then to Scott's point, you know, 12 months ago, we could, you know, we've, we've always been very transparent and honest with our valuation, though. It's something that we do. It's just sort of the strategy. Um, now we're doing the same thing. We do have an internal formula that we use. Daniela, my co-founder, is here, and it's based on three things. It's based on the tech, it's based on the team, and it's based on the traction. We have a platform that's built and it's proven. Um, so a certain amount of that valuation goes towards that. It's an honest product and technology that has been fully built out that can be plugged into something. That stands alone. Yes. We have revenue generation now. We are establishing product market fit. We, and we have a really great tech team 
tech teams are very hard to find right now. Yes. Data scientists are hard to find right now. So we also associate a value to that. So that's ultimately how we come up with evaluation. And it tends to be not inflated. It tends to be quite true. Nice. Mm -hmm. Davis, how, 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 would you, how, how would you look at valuations? You've, you've, you've probably seen hundreds come across your desk. Um, you know, just provide maybe some insights from the investor perspective. That was a really good answer, Kelly, by the way. Savvy. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think the answer for valuations is it really does depend on the team. And the, uh, the way I think about it is very, um, is a rational person, I would say. If you're selling me a dream um, in three minutes and I'm kind of sitting there going, okay, I have no idea what this person is saying, but they say they want $20 million. I'm just like, gosh, I don't, how, how can I possibly... <laughs> Get up to speed on this issue, which I feel like, you know, I'm not an expert in everything, but I have pretty good context for things in this industry at this point. Um, and then how do I go explain it to someone internally, right? And so if the person can sit down across from me and say, hey, this is what I do. This is how I'm going to generate money. This is how we're going to, like, you know, compete with people. And this is the amount of money I need to go accomplish that. Um, and this is, and I always say, you know, what do you want for valuation? And, and my view is you shouldn't negotiate heavily. I think that that's just a poisonous way to start a relationship. I think right. if the person says I want a hundred million dollars and in my head, I'm thinking this is kind of a $20 million business based on what I could see. I just say, Hey, thanks. Like really appreciate it. I'm not going to hardball you. I'm, you know, um, and so, but if the person says I want 24 and I go, well, it's kind of 20. So sure. You know, I mean, you're. It's funny, if, I find often entrepreneurs think that by asking for a lot of money and a higher valuation, they think they're establishing themselves as having gravitas in the conversation or something. I don't know what it is, but the truth is you end up looking irrational and have a misunderstanding. And, and for anyone that has done this long enough, when if you raise a too high of a valuation in your business, you're right, stuff happens to say it politely. If your business struggles before that next round comes together and you have to do a down round, the investor preferences keep me fine. It comes out of the management side. So I think really thinking through the cadence of partnerships, the amount of capital you need to get to that next point, give yourself a cushion. We're going to have all of those things go together where it's like, you know, even if I said we're going to give you extra money today at a higher valuation, it's like that could end up being to the detriment of the entrepreneurial team uh, or the entrepreneurs in two years from then. And I think that is not where we want to be. We want to build very strong partnerships and have rational, reasonable conversations with with other people around the table. And yeah, so, that's a good point. Justin. What, yeah. Davis, what Davis just said, because that was a, re a really good point. Anytime you set a price, there's actually like an implicit trade-off between two things. One is the amount of dilution you take on your business, which is pretty straightforward. But the second is optionality. And optionality defined as your ability to raise additional capital at higher prices or your ability to exit. And so every time you set the price, there's like a trade-off between these two things. So, um, it's really important to be mindful of it. And sometimes in the short run as a founder, like it, it kind of maps the two parts of your brain. Like there's one part that's like almost a little insecure and it's like kind of a vanity, like what you're priced at before an exit. And you're like, oh, I, this is sort of a leading indicator or like I'm ascribing some value to myself in the short run because it kind of maybe makes you feel better. But at the same time, if, like the other part of your brain is thinking like longer term, like I really want dollars in my pocket, right? I want to be able to buy stuff, right? at the end of this, not just have this piece of paper that says, oh, you're worth something. So I think that's a really, really important trade off. Nice. And, and so let, let's just talk a little bit about that relationship between, well, it might just be advisors or investors and, and the, the, the company. Um, you know, Davis, you were just talking about cutting a check and, and Scott, you as well. What, Scott, what, what, else, what, what else do you all see as important to provide those entrepreneurs other than, than just uh, dollars? I think access is a big thing you know, in this space. Um, I've been involved in, in the shoes where Kelly is now, where you know you're raising capital and you're trying to build your business. And over the years, um, you can generate those relationships. I think the big thing that we try and help the companies that we uh, not only invest in but advise with is, is access to people, to decision yeah. makers, to to allow groups like Quarter Four or other companies that we work with to speak to the right people to advance their product, to get into the places that they want to do. So we do a lot of that. Um, you know, I spent 15 years sitting in similar shoes where, where Kelly has of, of trying to grow and build your business. You get to a point where there's some people that can help you to do that. We try and do that with all, all of the portfolio companies that we invest in for sure. And just to Davis's point, I want to reiterate that 
when we look at companies we're going to invest in, the early stage number of what you peg your valuation at is huge because <laughs> no. when you need to raise money, I'm, and I'm, I think it, myself included, you raise X dollars and you think I'm good for two years or I'm good for a year. It never works out that way. No, it you, doesn't. It, either you end up <laughs> finding something that you want to acquire and add on yeah. or – uh, not everything goes exactly the way you think. And when you have to make that, that second or third raise after the fact, um, what we look at is not only if you're valuing your company at X right now, um, if you need money in a year from now or two years from now, what's the valuation going to be at that point in time that makes sense for us to reinvest? Yes. And I think that's a big part of, of, of the decision process. And, and, and so what, what, is, what is the role that, that you see? And Kelly, maybe just step outside of quarter four just real quick. But what's the role you see that, that startups play in the gaming industry? You know, we, we've, we've, we've certainly seen quite a few. Maybe, you know, Justin and I were just saying there was a lot in maybe, uh, there was very many in 2018 and 2019. There's a lot more coming out now. But what roles do they play in, in, in the gaming space now? Uh, there's a visionary component to startups. Um, Perhaps um, we come from a tech first background. We weren't originally from this space. Uh, we're female founders. So we're coming in with a very different viewpoint on how data works and how perhaps customer acquisition could work. Uh, you know, there's an emotional intelligence capacity to female founders sometimes that people uh, exclude. So um, as a female-founded uh, tech startup, that's what we bring. We bring a certain vision that perhaps hasn't been touched into before. Um, and I think predominantly that's it. Uh, and there are companies out there that are very thirsty for this type of, of innovation um, and viewpoint that they haven't seen before. We've been welcomed with open arms into this industry. We've had people say, what took you so long? We love what you're doing. So from experience, that's what we've experienced. That's what nice. we felt. Yeah. And, and Justin, where do, where do you see in, in some, some of the startups, what, what, what pain points do you see them, them solving? Um, I don't know. I don't really have a lot, I guess, to say on that. Um, I have to think about it maybe a little bit more. Davis? Um, raise your hand in this room if you think the B2C operators have amazing in-house tech stacks from A to Z. I didn't see a single hand. I saw go. one. I yeah. saw one. All right. Good to see you. All right. Um, but I'd, I'd to, love to hear in where fairness, you are. though, Davis, uh, if you would have asked that 12 months ago, you probably would have had people raise their hand. I just, I just venture to say that that is now being exposed completely right now. So I would say that you might have had people say that, but I think that was for a lack of understanding. No, to, of course. Not to be critical. No. Um, but I think that. That is what this industry can solve, right? Yeah. Whether or not, um, you know, I'm seeing Wayne and, you know, we're investors in U.S. integrity. It's a, it almost has to be external, right? You cannot have uh, a B2C sports book having uh, an integrity business in-house because it just inherently doesn't work, right? You've got to have an outside third party. So there are just parts of this industry that will never go in-house. Um, you know, some, some will and, you know, it'll be great if, you know, uh, Kelly and her business is acquired by someone tomorrow. That'd be amazing. But Tell you what, in five years, once Kelly's amazing AI goes inside of a big behemoth, there's probably going to be room for disruption at that point again, right? And so that's just how the culture of these industries work. So I think the people in this room and the people outside, I think that's really what they're providing is that it's almost like an external innovation lab. Yes. That, that nimbleness to, to the industry. Yeah, that's a good point. Scott? Yeah, I think to, to add on to that, I think, we know that the B2C play right now, that there's a certain tech roadmap that they have, and not a lot of times innovation uh, is necessarily at the forefront. It's fixing what they have now. And I've seen that from you know my time owning a, an in-stadium betting company in, in the UK uh, and working with all the betting brands over there. Uh, the, the, tech, the tech stacks are, are, are certainly not open to say, we're going to build this ourselves. So um, I think you know, to Davis's point, if you can provide that type of a solution that they know they need, but they don't have the roadmap in order to accomplish that, I think that's where, and then we look at companies that way as well too. Is, is there a fit with one of the bigger guys after the fact? Can this slot into a B2C play? Um, which I think, uh, you know, to, to Davis's point, I think that's a big part of the uh, How of long the is that operator's tech roadmap where you can slot in? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, a good friend of mine who's... Uh, he is uh, the chief uh, 
technology officer for for a land-based casino, and they are also looking at a mobile play as well to that. They can't do it on their own. They are basically right. looking for somebody to come in and solve a lot of their problems. So yes. I, I think that's going to last for. And, and another point was, you know, you can solve the, the point today with outside um, companies, but that's going to change in a year from now or two years from now. There's going to be new things that come along that you're going to have to uh, mm -hmm. to solve as well too. So I think it's going to be. I don't think there's a time frame when they catch up. I think the ones that are going to acquire bit components or businesses to their tech play to solve it um, are going to continue to do that going forward. Well, if we could just highlight one point here, it is interesting, those tech roadmaps, there's actually an issue where you might sign a commercial agreement because your technology is so innovative, but the problem is what's the wait time to get an integration today in big sports book? Yeah. Six months. I'm and, hearing sometimes a and year. And as an entrepreneur with a, with a burn, if you're not break yeah. even, then, then you're running into challenges. And so, yes, um, you know, we just talked about the B2C versus the B2B play. Uh, if you're B2B, uh, just understand that integrating that, that business into, into the existing operators is not tomorrow. It is, it is at least six months to 12 months, months from now. If anybody has any questions, I think we, we, we've got the ability to, for you to ask questions. I haven't seen any yet. Um, so don't, don't be shy. I'm, I'm going to start with one question. Uh, just, just share with me maybe the biggest learning that, that you had, uh, Justin, um, over, over starting a business and, and, and exiting um, and starting over. Like, what, what can you share with everybody, that, that one key learning? Kelly, I'm coming to you next. Well, I think one that it's not coming from me. It's, you know, I, I heard it from somebody else that, that was foundational was um, when you start these things, it's, it's, it's really important to have like a really clear value framework of like what success looks like. And a lot of your decisions should be, you know, kind of based on that. Um, because if, if you don't, it can, go, it can go really wrong really quickly. Um, and make sure everyone around you is comfortable with what success looks like. When I, when I pitched my investors, I was like, look, we're not, we're not building like a billion dollar company. We're building like, you know, a single or a double, which is what we did. And, and the people around us were, were cool with that. You know, I think you get, I think it gets really weird if, if you start kind of selling one thing and it's, you know, but it's not. And yeah, I think that's what I would say. Yeah. A bit of realism. Kelly. Honestly, uh, this is my second startup. My first one, I, I went at it alone. Um, and it's very hard to be a solo entrepreneur, especially when you need to scale rapidly and you need to start having someone focusing on the outside of the business and the inside of the business. I can honestly say that having a co-founder and the proper co-founder in this business, quarter four, Daniela, has made a lifetime of difference. We can hand off things to another, one another. It mitigates risk. And it gives us um, additional viewpoints as we're running the business. So for me, it is um, not being afraid to bring in the right co-founder, um, even if it means, you know, we've got to split up that equity. It doesn't matter because it's going to pay off for us in the long run. Yeah. Being selfish in an, in, in an entrepreneurial space mm -hmm. is, is really tough. And I think a lot of times people don't understand how much value somebody else can add or, or co-founders. In fact, I mean, Davis and, and, and you know, w what do you think about an individual that comes to you and says, I'm going to start this business on my own. I mean, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, one of our first, well, one of the first questions you always ask is, what do you want to, what does this business look like in five years? Yeah. And what's the hiring required to get there? Right? Yep. You, if you come to ask for money from someone and you don't have a hiring plan or an idea of like what the team looks like in 12 or 24 months from then, you're probably doing it wrong because we were, I was having breakfast with um, an entrepreneur um, that we've, we've backed, uh, hasn't disclosed yet, but um, last week and asked him what his day looked like. And it started at, you know, 5 a.m. and it went till midnight yep. every day within, you know, 30 minutes to work out. And I just like, that's not sustainable. Like as a human being, I'm worried about you, right? Bring on more, use the money to hire more. And I think that sustainability as a, you know, as a human and having empathy is really important, but it also is good investment. Um, since we're getting down on time, the only thing I wanted to make sure we discussed in these conversations that entrepreneurs are having with investors is be very thoughtful about the regulatory environment you're operating in. Um, Why is that, Davis? And I will say that the number of people that come to me, and I'm always very direct. Anyone that's talked to me knows that I, I will say, um, you know, I, I believe your business to be illegal. I'll just straight, I'll say it that way. And, you know, obviously- is Sorry, say that one more time. It, it is uh, illegal. I illegal. believe that often- uh, companies that are pitching things and everyone says, well, look at, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel and what they accomplished. It's like, 
how many people have gone to jail for illegal gambling? Like no one focuses on, on the you know, hundreds of people that have done that. Um, so I would say be very mindful of investors are willing to back disruption, but also if there's that, you know, you're reaching that gray area, stay as close as you can to the regulated part and innovate around the regulations. That is a core part of the great investors in the space is we all have context and understanding and we will help you do that. But I think that that is something that's often missed is like this idea of disruption. You're not gonna disrupt the laws, not in the short term. You might in the long term, but good luck with that. Um, but anyway, I just want to make sure we touch on that. Get a legal a opinion. Oh yeah, and, and have it signed by a partner. Correct. Yes. A, a, at a good firm that we've heard of. Very important. Very yeah, right. Very important. Scott, what's the what's the one learning? I think uh, to to add on to Kelly's point, not only obviously having a good group, but I think there's retention issues as well too. It's very Oof. difficult to to maintain your technology team. It's difficult to hire new people. Um, I think as you know, as entrepreneurs, whether it's, you know, Kelly's group, for example, um, be long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. So share some of the equity to, to retain quality people or yes. to bring quality people in, I think is a big part of it as well too, because you're only two or three people away from, you know, that person walking out the door because of somebody else. Um, and they may not have the vested interest in it, um, that can really disrupt your business and, and cut, creates problems. So I think you have to look at it from a retention standpoint, as well as a hiring standpoint. That's, that's a great point. And also just, you know, as entrepreneurs, you're, you're all in you're, your staff, your staff, your staff typically is, is not. And so the more all in you can have everybody in that company on that vision that, that Justin was talking about, uh, you know, the more the more important um, I think I think that is, um, you know, be, and also just, you know, the, the, the operators are struggling to hire people. Casinos are struggling to hire people. The entire gaming industry is, is struggling to hire people. So you're going to probably face and we are are def, we at Chalkline are certainly facing that. I'm sure, you know, Jay, you know, Kelly, you are you are as well. OK, so that's that wraps up our our panel. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. And on the zero. <laughs>